but this was exactly what he needed at the time. When we picked him up after four months, he turned on his phone and saw the where have you been text, and he promptly responded to many of them saying, sorry, I was in the shower, and my bad, my phone was dead. And at that point, I knew that Jack was back. His humor and smile had returned, and it was the best to see that. After his wilderness program, Jack attended a new school. Our communication was short. We had short phone calls and texted each other through Google Hangouts. But, but this didn't keep him from sending me the best memes and new songs to listen to. Even though we weren't together, he was still my awesome older brother, always working to preserve our tight relationship. The past couple of years have been a roller coaster ride for Jack and my family. He's definitely had his ups and downs. However, Jack lives his life openly and is willing to talk about his mental health struggles to anyone who is interested. His openness and willingness to talk about the rough stuff is one of the reasons why I love and respect him so much. He's also proud of what he's been through and what he's accomplished through his tough years. He's not ashamed or embarrassed and encourages everyone to feel the same. He's living proof that even when times seem dark and hard, things can and do get better. Today, Jack is happy and healthy and thriving at art school and hopefully not peeing in any more cabinets. Thank you. Friends, Romans, Cap. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turned with their bones, so let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral, he was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fail. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus sees, set, says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the looper cow, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambitious? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. Hi, I'm Frank Roberts, a four-year senior from East Windsor, Connecticut. I had to memorize this passage in freshman year in Mr. Biondi's English class. I have not forgotten it, and I doubt I ever will. This will be one of the things that I have taken from Southfield and will carry for the rest of my life. When I look at my, my years at Southfield, in what I'm going to take with me, besides a million t-shirts, is a bunch of random memories. I can't seem to find a pattern to what I remember so vividly. But what I do know is that the more things I did, the more memories I made. And the best advice I can give to be, give to be present in everything you do. So don't sit in class counting the minutes until you leave. Try to engage. Listen to the stories your teachers tell. It is just as important to participate in all of the school activities outside what is required. Color Wars is this Saturday, and you have no excuse not to go. Because if you skip and find out that everyone had a good time, and you were not there because you wanted to sit in your dorm room doing nothing, you will regret not going. And we have already had a year of missed opportunities out of our control. Don't make this year another. And don't let what you remember from Southfield be a series of regrets and missing out. Make sure that you have the best possible Southfield experience for you, which is not the same for everyone, and each and every one of you have to take a look at what you want and everything you can do to maximize your experience. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cormac Sullivan and I'm a four-year senior from Southfield Connecticut. So for the past few weeks, my advisor has been asking me about what I'm going to talk about. I repeatedly told him that I'd be talking about my passions of music and video making but that is far from the truth. Today, I'll be talking about the gratitude I have for my advisor, Mr. Morgan. I've always been shy, and people know, who know me 
You know me well, I still know that I'm very shy and reserved. Mixed that with starting high school, I was a nervous friend. After the first day of school, my social life quickly evolved into going to soccer practice, spending an hour at my house, then coming back up for dinner at the dining hall with my good friend Jack. I continued this process through the first month of school, and I regret that I didn't really expose myself to the social life that sent to the academy office. My classes were soon going okay, and I was getting to know my classmates more and more. Spanish and music quickly became two of my favorite subjects, and to this day, they are still some of my favorite classes. So although I enjoyed parts of my academics, the switch from middle school to high school was very difficult. At about the same time, school was getting into the swing of things that fall, my grandmother was hospitalized with a blood illness. But in the moment, I didn't think of it much because she had illnesses in the past. One week in the hospital became two weeks, then three. My worries became greater and greater, and when my family from the West Coast began to book plane tickets to Connecticut, I knew it was no good. It was Sunday, November 11th, the day before my fall, fall exam freshman year that my grandmother passed away. This was a huge blow to everything. Emotionally, I was destroyed, and I saw that in my final grade. For the rest of the week, I tried to balance family with finals, and the, and the week felt like, like it would never end. I remember crying every night, just waiting for the next day to come. Right after the physics exam, I received an email from Mr. Morgan to come to his office to check in. I remember sitting down in one of his chairs, and the first thing he said to me was, I'm so sorry. I immediately began crying as I realized he knew what was happening. The distractions of the events that had happened the night before overtook everything. And after Mr. Morgan had calmed me down, he expressed interest in helping me through the finals. He knew how close I was with my grandmother and the effects of her passing them, and the effects her passing brought on me. The next day, the funeral took place in West Hartford in a small chapel. As I walked in, I saw familiar faces of relatives, and I walked with my mom and brothers to the front row. Mr. Morgan was stood next to the pew, and I immediately realized it was him. He extended his arms out and gave me a huge hug. I remember his murmuring, Thank you for coming. Into, thank you for coming into his shoulder as I cried. The rest of the day was kind of a blur, but from that point on, I knew I could count on Mr. Morgan for me. He could see my pain, and I could feel his empathy. It was comforting to know that someone other than my family knew what I was going through, both mentally and socially. I would end up meeting with Mr. Morgan almost every week after school resumed after Thanksgiving, and I would, and I opened up to him about my struggles. These talks helped me with my tough transition. He helped. He helped me stretch out my comfort zone, and he gave me a safe space, safe space to break down, and I'm extremely grateful Mr. Morgan was able to help me. In such a hard few months of school I had, he was able to connect and create solutions with me. Classes soon became more enjoyable, and Mr. Morgan pushed me to be more social and helped me come to terms with my loss. I began to make real, real friends and more friends. Soon, Uno became one of my good friends and not just the guy who showed up late um, to school. Jay, Eric, Brian, and Jack turned into real friends that I enjoyed spending my Saturday nights with playing video games and picking up football. I, in fact, vividly remember Eric losing our Madden tournament and having to run around the quad without a shirt in the snow before lights out in February. It was these times that made me realize how much Mr. Morgan has opened my, opened my eyes to what something has to offer. He's helped me overcome the hardest months of my life, and I'm so grateful he is my advisor. I wanted to speak about Mr. Morgan today because I don't think I've ever told him how much a positive impact he's made on my life. So I just want to take, take, the, to take this opportunity to say thank you, Mr. Morgan. I think it's worth to talk about such a meaningful subject today because how much credit Mr. Morgan should get for my success in Southfield. I encourage you all to interact with your advisor as much as possible because at the time you might need them most, they will be there with empathy and kindness. Thank you.
After a few rounds, with no surprise at all, I was placed on the 14. Despite my disappointment, I remember my dad's words. Nothing is impossible for a woman heart. I worked harder on basketball than ever before. I arrived to each practice on time, remembering that practice makes perfect. Did I improve? Maybe. But still, for most games, I sat on the bench. <laughs> While sitting on the bench one game, I reflected my situation. Why do I keep trying to stick with it, but still can't find my position? Maybe basketball is not the right choice for me. I recall a joke set by a famous Chinese singer on the variety show. Nothing is difficult in the world as long as you're willing to give up. The first time I heard this, I laughed. But after everything I went through with basketball, I began to think maybe those words were happy with wisdom. What appeared on the surface to be ironic was actually an insightful statement emphasizing the importance of good decision making. Instead of banging my head against the wall of basketball, why not create space in my life for something potentially more valuable based on my talent and hobby? Thus, in my sophomore year, uh, in my sophomore year I encouraged myself to participate in a completely different sport, rivalry. I walked into trial with curiosity, but little expectations for getting a great result due to the tragedy which happened last winter. I observed what the seniors did and followed. Lay on the ground, line up the down with the target, pull the trigger, and surprise. Even I'm short-sighted and have astigmatism, I hit the target. <laughs> it was not easy to shoot a bullseye. In the range, I repeated practicing the shooting positions required in a match. I learned to adjust my breathing, heart rate, aiming on the target for a long time, and staying calm to seize the best moment to put the trigger. I could see clear progress that over the right first season as the holes in my target paper clustered together. I suddenly found myself not a bench player, but a top scorer on the team. The feeling that my contribution, contributions actually mattered to my team motivated me further. By the end of the season, our school's JV referee team won the Connecticut State Championship. I personally placed in the top 10% in the 89th annual Connecticut, Connecticut State Gallery match. Thinking back over these experiences, I realized although my dad's original advice is well meaning, it is not universally correct. Willingness is certainly useful, but we should open our minds to new possibilities instead of falling ahead blindly on the same doomed endeavor. I used to believe giving up was a sign of weakness. Now I think differently. In my finite time, I should regularly reflect on whether my efforts have been delivered to the best of my capabilities and talent. If not, I should be honest about the situation. And after every measure has been tried, I must change course to a new destination in time. There's no limit of human potential and opportunity. Try bravely and open up new possibilities. Success is in reach as long as you make your decision first. Thank you for listening.
home, it doesn't actually have to just be one place. It can really be whatever makes you feel like you're at home. I think the only reason the most recent move didn't prompt a, prompt a second mini identity crisis was because for the past four years, I have found some unexpected kind of home. And without me even realizing it, it became a place I knew that I could rely on. A place that provided so many moments and people that I could find a sense of security in. There are definitely a lot of examples that come to mind of good moments at Southfield, but I think I'd just share a few examples of how sometimes it's the people in that place that make it a home. My first little family I found in the fall of freshman year, where me and many others decided to dedicate ourselves to the sport of volleyball. Uh, I soon learned dedication isn't enough, you actually need to know the rules, so me and a lucky other few were placed on the third team. This honor meant that we got to spend our afternoons gossiping with Miss Henley and sending balls like, up into the weirdly large fans in Kenny. I like to think Southfield forces us all onto these teams because regardless of skill or lack thereof, sometimes the team itself just makes it almost worth it. But sometimes you find moments that the school never intended at all uh, and maybe would have preferred not to happen. Like sophomore year when my roommate Libby and I decided we could use some new decorations or it's just something missing in our room. Uh, so we decided the only viable option, obviously, was to get a saltwater aquarium, um, home to two pound fish. I, I wasn't aware of this at the time. Uh, apparently, a whole saltwater aquarium is a very different responsibility than a beta fish in a Tupperware. Um, we soon learned we were unfit to be Herbert and Bartholomew's parents uh, because they immediately started fighting. Apparently, conflicts are very territorial. Um, and we were soon only parents to one. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bartholomew, I mean, you can see one, you can tell his name, but he eventually perished too because um, spring break turned into COVID. We never got anyone to come get his tank. So <laughs> when we came back to get our things in the summer, I wasn't just packing up my clothes and bedding. I also had to have a funeral for a few little fish bones. Um, <laughs> So it's things like that that make me realize that it's sometimes the dumbest things that make you feel like you're in the right place. And it's definitely been nice to realize that more and more as I've gotten older, um, because it's the big and really little things. Uh, like there's some I'm sure we can all relate to, like that feeling of very genuine inner peace that an entire class shares when they're let out early, or the friends you make in those classes solely on the basis that neither of you have any clue what's going on. Maybe it's a feeling of just knowing what kind of sassy comment each teacher will make when you walk in late with coffee and being really grateful for the moments where they just don't say anything at all. We're only here so long, so it's not permanent. And even if we try our hardest to make the best of everything, the good moments can still be really hard to recognize. I know many people say make the most of your time at Suffield, but I'd argue that it's more important to be happy with what you did make of it. I'd really say to just take time to notice the good moments, the, the moments that you feel like you're at home, like you're in the right place, at least for a little bit, because you're giving yourself a chance to settle into the most genuine version of yourself, even if it's just in front of a few people. Allowing yourself to really grow and change over the years, knowing that it's safe to do so because you can count on having at least a home here. And after all my time here, I think it's safe to say I feel like I do. So thank you, Southfield, for being a place that ended up being a home that I can count on.
For example, Avi was scary, I was competitive, and didn't enjoy team sports. Games were stressful. I learned to feel good about tackling something difficult and came to enjoy it a little. Studying and living in the U.S. was a big adjustment, but I became a member of Sophia community, gained much academically and socially and mentally. I learned many skills and grown as a person. I want to thank several people who have made a difference in my life during my journey at Sophia Academy. It is really important to express true gratitude to people who helped me grow, and a chapel space is a great opportunity to express my thoughts. First, I want to thank my advisor, Mr. Ken, for always believing in me and trusting me. Also, my art teachers, Mrs. Fuller and Mrs. Graham, who helped me to experience different art fields and medium. Finally, the most important people among all in the last four years, my family, especially my dad, was always there for me and always on my side no matter what. I'm so happy and blessed to have you as my dad. Good luck everyone and thank you.
To those of you who don't know me, my name is Hannah Cody, and I'm a two-year senior from Suffield, Connecticut. There's a part of my life I don't share with most people. It's not necessarily because I don't want to, but because I know a lot of people won't understand or won't relate. I used to be uncomfortable with the overwhelming questions and comments people had about the accident, but now I understand that people are just curious. I hope that by sharing this side of my life with you all, you can relate, to, relate this to something you're going through. A lot of us are more similar than we might think. In June of 2016, my mom, my brother Cam, and I, along with my soon-to-be stepdad and stepsister, moved into our new beautiful house in Suffield. We were all so happy that we finally found our dream home and that we could start a fresh chapter in our lives. Up until August, the summer of 2016 was one of the most relaxing, fun, and innocent summers of my life. Cam, my stepdad, Les, and I had become inseparable. We spent countless hours with each other every day, whether that be playing categories in the pool, riding around the lawn in our go-kart, or learning new recipes, because Les was one of the most talented chefs I'd ever met. Les had become the best second dad I could have asked for. Of course, the picture I'm painting in your head seems almost too perfect, right? That's how it seemed to us anyways. We were all so soaked up in the moment and excited for our future that it never crossed our mind that something could go wrong. Our perfect life we planned, however, only lasted 44 days. The night of August 6, 2016 had changed my family and I's life forever. That evening, we were having our typical barbecue and pool party with friends. At around 10 o'clock, the adults had joined the kids in our adolescent pool games. You know, the one where you place a tube anywhere in the pool and you try to jump into it. After I'd taken my turn jumping in, I swam to the edge of the pool to watch Les perform. He took a few deep breaths and sprinted towards our shallow pool. His, jumping, his jump took a shocking flight into a cannonball position. Right as I blinked, his position switched into a dive, and there was nothing to stop him except gravity. A concerning amount of time went by, and he had not elevated from the bottom of the pool. We all became worrisome, so our friend's dad swam over to help him. Once afloat, Les was stuttering words. At first, I couldn't really make out what he was saying. He kept repeating, crap, I'm so sorry. Why was he apologizing? It was because he knew something in that moment that nobody else did. He believed that he would probably not survive this accident. And if he did, he would never be able to move again. I vaguely remember this part because of the utter shock I was in, but my mom had now witnessed the accident, so I was the one who told her who, what had happened and that she should call 911. I had never seen her more ghostly and panicked. The rest of the night was a blur, but watching the ambulance pull out of my driveway was incredibly heartbreaking. The perplexity of what would be the outcome of this simple mistake consumed me. All the events leading up to the dive were played over and over again in my head. Was there something anyone could have done so that this whole mess was avoided? But there wasn't. That evening, Les suffered a C4 spinal cord fracture, which paralyzed him from the chest down. He was immediately put into emergency surgery that ultimately saved his life. Les stayed in Bay State Hospital in Springfield for 10 days, battling much more than just paralysis. With the accident, he contracted multiple infections, including pneumonia, and had reached a dangerously high white blood cell count. The doctors every day warned my mom with tears in their eyes that Les's conditions were considerably fatal. Les then transferred to Spalding Hospital in Cambridge because it was much more suited for his paralysis than a general hospital. At the beginning of the two and a half months spent at Spalding, the doctors told Les and my mom that he would never be able to breathe, eat, and talk on his own ever again let alone move any part of his body. My mom found all of these claims ridiculous, telling doctors, nurses, PTs, and OTs that they didn't know less, and that he had the patience and persistence to overcome the aspects of his condition that were treatable. By the end of his stay there, he was able to do all the things listed except move. We knew that him gaining feeling and movement in his body was impossible, but honestly, we were just happy to hear his voice again. During the chaotic time spent at Spalding, my mom would travel back and forth from Suffield to Boston every other day to support Les while also manage parenting and work on her already full plate. I honestly don't know what superpower she has, but I can't even fathom how incredibly draining that schedule must have been. Mom, I apologize on Cam and behalf if we were ever in high maintenance during that time. Besides Les, you are the strongest person I have ever met, and I cannot thank you enough for never giving up and being a role model for Cam and I. You deserve all the love and happiness times 10 that life hands at you. I am happy to say that Les is here in the audience with us, pretending that this is his first time listening to this speech. 
Lest I can't even describe to you how happy I am that you were able to persevere through one of the most difficult accidents anyone could go through. Sometimes I forget you still suffer daily, and I apologize for all the doors I slam, knowing it sends painful shocks down your spine, or interrupting much-needed naps when you're running a fever just to see how you're doing. I'm incredibly proud of you, and I want you to know that you're my biggest inspiration. Last night I lived a happy life with my mom, where they spend their days parenting Cam and I, four hens and one obnoxious rooster, going to endless doctor's appointments, and playing song quiz. There are so many more stories and aspects of our lives that I can share, like the story that I wasn't invited to their wedding in the hospital, kidding, but also not kidding, or for the close relationships I formed with Les's aides, Jen, Lauren, and Harley. But unfortunately, time is limited, and I hope each and every one of you gain insight on the life that my family, family and I live, and recognize that some of the simplest tasks we do on a daily basis are a privilege. Imagine never being able to hug the person you love the most, with one squeeze just showing how much you care, or not being able to pet your favorite animals, even when they're begging for your attention. Remember the story when your coach is yelling at you to run sprints and you feel like giving up, because some people go a lifetime dreaming of taking just one step. I appreciate you all listening to our story, and if you ever have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. Thank you.